Washington, D.C. is my home away from home. I've worked here for the better part of three decades as a founder entrepreneur, policy expert, and author. Probably the longest title. Um, everybody sort of shortened it to ONC for sanity. Merci sake. Mercifully. Yeah, mercifully. I've learned leadership secrets from many healthcare executives who understand that Washington is the largest payer and regulator of healthcare. She said, well, because you'll never get a husband if you do that. <laughs> I began interviewing healthcare leaders many years ago because what better way to learn how they think, why they make it to the top, and how they remain there. Think about what was your most challenging engagement? Healthcare has been the most difficult problem. <laughs> Let me just say that. We'll talk about that later. Early on, Dr. Karen DeSalvo considered a career in ballet until she thought about the time living away from her family. She then embarked upon a career of medicine, public health, federal government service, and she is now the chief health officer at Google. We divided this engaging interview into two parts. Part one includes Karen's formative years and how they influenced her professional decisions. We will discuss why she chose a career in medicine, her years on the Tulane Medical School faculty, and the joy of being commissioner of health for New Orleans. Karen is a self-described reluctant leader, and we'll learn how she overcame reservations to excel at leadership in multiple settings. Well, good afternoon, Karen, and welcome. Thank you, Gary. It's so good to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, we're pleased to have you at the microphone today. As we've discussed, this show is about leadership, and you've certainly had a distinguished career as a leader, so we can't wait to get into some questions here. Why don't we kick it off? If you just think about your career, Karen, uh, what are the prominent leadership lessons that you've learned? Well, um, I have had, as you say, a really, uh, what some people think of as a, an, an, a different kind of career journey for, for physicians. But I think um, for me all along the way, it's been thinking about um, serving people and in, in that service, it's, um, the, the lessons are about, about listening and not being assumptive. My mom taught me a lot about not assuming, uh, but apparently I didn't learn it as well until I was really uh, in service. So it's, it's really, I think, uh, recognizing that though I'm learned, if you will, I get, you know, I've had a, a lot of opportunity for education. There's so much that you gain and learn when you just open your heart and mind, especially to the people that you're there to serve, patients all the way to the world. What would the young Karen think about leadership compared to, to now after you've held several leadership jobs? Did you recognize leadership early on as something that you felt you wanted to become part of? I'm one of those reluctant leaders, Gary. <laughs> I'm one of those people that am always surprised when I find myself in a position of leadership. There's really uh, definitely one exception to that, um, and that was after Hurricane Katrina when I very intentionally stepped into the void because I felt that um, it was a responsibility that I had um, to my patients and to the community. Um, but, I, but I find sometimes that I'm surprised when I'm asked to um, be on the board or run for an office or um, uh, you know, be the, uh, you know, be the student council president or whatever that is. And I don't right. you'd think that by now I would be accustomed to it, but I always, maybe it's just because when I look around the room, I see so much talent and, and I, I have to say, Gary, probably a lot of this is just, a, a, I'm a hard worker and um, I'm pretty tenacious. So I don't give up when something's important to me and probably people recognize that. And I get asked to take on um, responsibility and, and leadership across the way. So, but I will tell you this, um, young Karen, whatever, what do you define young Karen? How young is she? Let me ask you that question. Uh, I was thinking, you know, around medical school time, that's that time frame. Young Karen, medical school um, would not recognize this Karen, I think. She, she was really, she was thinking that she was going to be on a pathway that was definitely much more in the vein of a, a traditional clinician. And, and really and practicing medicine as the, the bulk of what she did. So I think that the, the turns that I've taken in my career would be surprising, but I don't think she would be as surprised by the fact that she's been asked to lead. Have you had mentors or others that you maybe have modeled your approach to leadership after? 
Oh, I've had a lot. Um, I, I, you know, one of the things I learned to do early in my career was um, to ask people I admired for their CV or their resume and use that as a way um, to, to, to see what their journey had been like across their, across their career. What was the first paper they published? What was the first, you know, role that they had that was significant enough to add to a CV? And and that way, sometimes I just learned about them. This is before Google, of course, that when you could Google someone's name, I learned about them uh, if, uh, in the background. But uh, I would say since I was very young, I've had people I've been able to look up to, to learn from, and who have helped me through direct mentorship or sponsorship uh, all along the way. I'm super grateful for that. I had one mentor who I'll call out, a fellow named John Peabody. He's a physician who was a formal mentor of mine for a, um, a career development award I had from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And one of the most powerful things John taught me um, was to say no. And uh, you know, as a, as a leader, we're often asked to say yes and be available and to step up to the plate. John helped me realize that um, it was it was okay and sometimes necessary to say no so that I could give my attention um, to the things that really mattered to me. So uh, yeah, a great example of how somebody guided and steered and, and took the time to help me understand that there was going to be a lot of opportunity. I didn't have to take them all at once. What was the first leadership role that you had that you definitely recognized, hey, I am in a leadership role here? It probably goes all the way back to high school, but I don't think anybody wants to need to go back that that far. No, that's, that's fine. That's I, fine. I'll, I'll pick one a little more relevant to medicine, which is being chief resident. That was, um, it was a role I very much loved being chief resident. I'm an internist by training and, um, and love, love, love clinical medicine and the richness of what you, you know, learn from not only medicine, but from patients and sort of the, the, the caring for them. And being chief resident, you have the opportunity to not only lead in a managerial sense, setting the schedules and understanding the needs and wants and wishes of all the residents and trainees. You do a ton of teaching. Uh, I spent a lot of time, um, again, I'm dating myself, but in a library, <laughs> looking things up to make sure I was as up to the minute, you know, and what the literature was, but also going back in time to understand the origins of why um, we practice medicine the way that we did. And I had in that role also, um, not only opportunity for management and for role model leadership, that's the teaching part, um, but also for this higher order administrative strategic work. And it was a, a, a time when our residency training program was needing to undergo some, some improvements. And we were tasked by the new chairman of the department, me and the other chief residents, to, to build a new curriculum, one that would really meet the needs of the, of the time, that would really build the next generation of really high quality physicians and so all mixed into that one role I learned how how delightful it is to be able to not only manage and be a mentor role model but also that strategic part of my brain that I would love to exercise and begin to think about building the future for the uh, younger up-and-comer uh, leaders that would that listen to this show what advice would you give to them you know I always tell people um, to pace themselves which Gary is not my best quality. <laughs> so as much as, as as much as John Peabody taught me to say no, and and I've gotten better at over over with each with each uh, year. I also um, I'm a very passionate person, and I get excited, and like many folks, I want to take things on, and uh, I want to do a lot of good in the world. And that sounds so silly when I, I say it aloud, but it matters to me. And it's hard when you have that kind of a passionate drive to not only say no, but to know that you don't have to solve everything right away. So I, I, like, I want them to, to realize that the journey is so important. The people that you'll get to know on the journey will make you better, smarter, it'll enrich your life, and that um, you, have to just, you have to take time to build those relationships and experiences to hone your skills because you never know when that big thing is going to come. But if you're racing towards that one, solving that one goal and not really thinking about other opportunities or um, not really giving yourself the downtime to, to reflect and make sure that you're making yourself better for the next turn of the crank, I think, I think you don't do yourself or others a service. Have you found that you're better able to reflect now 
than you were when you were younger? I know I fall into that category. I think I'm getting better at it. I, I certainly want to continue to be better. I'm uh, like many, you know, like many people who are um, busy and, um, you know, engaged in work they care a lot about. You, you have to force to make that time. And one of the Starting when I was 40, I started running. It's a, a, maybe a late age that people would think to start running, but it turned out to be, and it still is, my time that I reflect. It's the time that it's just me and the whatever, the trail, the street, and my thoughts, and I can just get out there and let, and let the ideas begin to formulate in my head and put the pieces together. I, I, the reflection for me isn't just about what happened, it's about what could be and how what I've been seeing and know can fit together into a new opportunity, a new way um, for, for, what, for the work that we have to get done. So I guess it's my meditation, Gary, but I, I call it, but it's, it's running for me. Yeah, that makes good sense. Well, as a, as a highly successful woman, if I ask you that same question, uh, which is what advice would you have for up and coming leaders? Would you, would you modify that at all for up and coming women leaders? Oh, you know, the, the, I'm, I'm in this really, I might, and I'm in this really interesting generation where we started to learn that we, that we didn't need to be perfect at everything, nor could we be. And I, I think even as a kid, I was raised that um, you can be successful professionally and personally and um, have, you know, have great work-life balance and, and take good care of your health and well-being. And, and the reality is, is it's not quite that easy. And as we know from the data, women do take on a lot of the family responsibilities, not only for their kids, but for extended family members, for their parents. And so I think it's expectation setting for them to know, again, pace yourself. You don't have to achieve everything in the first 10 to 20 years of your career. It's okay to prioritize family. It's okay to be a human. I think is what I, you know, what I, what I would definitely want to say. I think the second, so that's sort of the pacing and being a human and acknowledging that that you're not, you don't have to be superwoman to be successful. The second thing for women is um, this difficulty that we have of deciding whether we're going to fit into the a male-dominated industry by becoming more like men in the male dominated industry, or if we're gonna change the industry to be one that's more inclusive. I guess you can probably get a sense of where my head is about that. But I, I you know, I, 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 I have this example that I think of sometimes when I was early in my, med in my medical career, I was the only woman in leadership in the Department of Medicine. Um, I was the section chief of general medicine. I was very early in my career when I was asked to step into that role. And I was encouraged by some to wear like a scarf the way that men wore a tie so that I would dress the part basically. And I've always been a pretty conservative dresser. So that, you know, it was like not so much the issue of, of uh, it was, it was literally to add to my suit, something that would look more like a tie. And I thought that was such an odd comment because I was much more interested in adding manuscripts and grants, <laughs> peer reviewed grants to, to my armamentarium than, than, than the outfit. And I think it was just a, uh, or it was so many lessons there, but one was, was I needed them to understand that I came with substance, that um, it wasn't just the way I was going to uh, uh, show up physically and also try to assimilate into that world. I was going to assimilate from the standpoint of I knew it was important to have peer-reviewed grant funding and I knew it was important to, to publish peer-reviewed quality manuscripts, but they also needed to understand that having a woman might, may, might mean that we're going to have a different kind of uh, culture that we're going to have an, an inclusive one that would allow not just the Karens to show up, but all the women that I would help develop or help recruit to come into the environment. And we did. Very Tulane has become much more uh, diverse uh, in that frame. That's where I was early in my career, and I think the the guys were super open to it. It was just kind of a knee-jerk reaction, like you need to assimilate as opposed to we should create a new way. What about you and your background allowed you to? kind of be independent and just take that position because a lot of women I don't think did at that point hopefully life is more diverse now and more inclusive now but what about you made you feel that you just wanted to go right ahead I wish I knew <laughs> and I'll tell you a little bit about my background Gary I um, um, my, my parents 
married pretty young and had a, a pretty unhappy uh, marriage. My dad left when I was five, and my mom had three kids, including a, a newborn infant, my little sister, and I was the middle child. So she had her hands full raising the three of us alone. We were poor, and she didn't have family um, to go to. So we were on our own as a unit, like pretty early on, with a pretty young mom. I mean, my mom was, was only in her in her uh, mid mid to late 20s at that time. So she um, would take scrape the seeds out of the cantaloupe, the first cantaloupe she'd buy in the season and dry them out and plant them in the side garden of the rental house that we had to grow our food. But she would do that with tomatoes and everything else. She sewed our clothes. We um, only shopped at Goodwill. I think the word I'm looking for is we were resourceful. We learned that super early and, and I learned um, that you could be scrappy and resourceful and still get still make it and also still get ahead. So that was instilled in me at an early age. Um, and I think that gave me a, probably a sense of confidence that um, I could I could build things, do things where there hadn't been something before. Um, and, and that was certainly true about what I needed to forge for myself professionally. No one um, had been to college or uh, med school in my family. This was like a new thing I needed to build. I will say this other thing, so that was the that was very young Karen. Um, I think younger Karen as a doctor. I hope this doesn't sound uh, egotistical, but I was a really good doctor, and so I was really confident about my abilities um, in that in that setting of a, of a, a medical school. I was a really good doctor, a really good teacher, and I had a, a a good understanding of the kinds of things that that would make a difference in 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 their world. So I felt I was coming from a place of not just passion, but but of certainty that my North Star and my abilities to get there um, were lined up. And that probably when I walked in the room gave me a, a sense of confidence that, that I wouldn't have otherwise had. So what is it? Confidence plus scrappiness equals successful leadership? I don't know. That might be a new equation. Well, it certainly worked in your case. At what point, Karen, did you think about medicine as a career? I was young. I was um, about 13, and I was a, um, one of the things that, that my mom did with us after school, since she was working, um, was we went to the Austin Recreation Center. I grew up in Austin, Texas, and they had basically free after school programs. It was a place for us to go that was safe. So um, uh, in that environment, uh, I took to dancing and acting, and uh, definitely ballet, and would spend hours there after school and into the evening. So I really thought I was gonna go into ballet uh, as, as a profession for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, certainly probably um, not in my head at the time, but in reality now I probably wasn't good enough, but I, I was being asked to, to, um, to audition, uh, to go to, to schools, to go away to schools. And I realized I just didn't want that life. I didn't wanna be um, uh, away from my family at that time. I didn't wanna have that kind of a, a a, a career as a ballerina that was really difficult and and financially insecure relative to other careers and growing up poor it was really important to me that I have financial certainty so that um, caused me to do a little thinking um, maybe create a little table with some pros and cons of things and uh, I was at the same time doing a book report um, for, for a class for a science class that I had and um, I did it on radiation oncology because my mom was a clerk in uh, an office a, a of radiation oncologist at the time. So I went there, spent an afternoon fo uh, following them around and thought, well, this is cool. It's science and helping people. And it seems like a very stable career. I should be a doctor. And that is pretty much how that is the story. Uh, it happened over a very short period of time. I was pretty thoughtful about it at such a young age. And then on the good, man, as soon as I stepped into it, born for it. Like just, yeah, that, that's what I was meant to do. Um, it's, it's really pretty great. That's very cool. Now, what about policy and politics? Because that's kind of intertwined with medicine throughout mm -hmm. your career. When did you become interested uh, in that? You know, um, I think I had an inkling that I was interested in policy even early in my academic career when I was doing health services research. Because I was the, 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 the gist of it is that I went from taking care of 
individual patients, and I did continue to do that for decades, but taking care of an individual with, say, diabetes, and began to understand it, you know, from them and my relationship with them that their life happened, or their, their first it was their, their disease happened in a context. The context I saw most acutely was the other doctors who cared for them or the health system in which they worked. And that caused me to want to be a teacher, to teach other doctors to do great quality care, to, and then the next layer was, how can I make the hospital system higher quality? How can I make the ambulatory environment more accessible? That's that layer of the system around them. And I think as I began to do that work, I realized that there were also um, payer systems and community contacts and, and these other concentric rings um, that were uh, causing different differential health outcomes, especially in the patients that I was caring for, which were largely from communities of color or low income um, or uninsured. So when Katrina happened in 2005, Hurricane Katrina, um, and I was in the midst of you know teaching research, clinical care, and, and leadership roles in the in the medical school at the time. I uh, something had to give, right? So the things that you care about, but but though some things started to give, I actually ended up adding because I thought, well, I can make a bigger difference in the lives of my community if I'm thinking about the policy context that's shaping the way our health system is set up or how transportation systems are set up. And that, that for me was just a sort of stepping back and reflecting at the time of that disaster that the poor health that I was helping my patients navigate, maybe this was our chance to shape policy so that them, not only for them, but the next generations to come would have access to healthy food and green space and public transportation that could get them to jobs and or jobs that would give them meaningful economic opportunity, all those things leading to better health in addition to great, to great access to great care, including uh, great primary care. So it was, very, it was very driven by my interest in helping my patients, honestly. I mean, it was just like, well, this will work, but it'll be better if, if we keep adding things. I think the politics piece, I'll just want to make a comment about that, is um, one of the most interesting jobs I've had. Um, it was when I was uh, in the Obama administration and I served as the Assistant Secretary for Health. And that is a job that very much lives at the nexus of science, policy, and politics. And it was the first time I saw how crisply, not only are they intersectional, but, but how, how that you can see data differently depending on where you sit and how important it is to have people who know community and know science and like, you know, know medicine to be in those seats and are thinking about all those things uh, contemporaneously so they can balance them and, and, make a, and make a good judgment. But I'd say over time, um, policy is a place where I, I just feel like there's so much opportunity to do good. And, and it's the place I always nav navigate back to. Politics, less interesting to me. Science, always interesting, but it has to be science-based policy. What were the circumstances that led to your becoming Commissioner of Health in New Orleans? And particularly, given your how good a clinician you are, and it seems like that was really a key part of your kind of professional being, at least for a while, did you have to give that up when you became the Commissioner of Health in New Orleans? I had to scale back, but I still was able to practice um, while I was there. And in fact, I, I still practiced a little bit when I was in Washington, but I had already been scaling back, Gary, because after Katrina, um, my role increasingly became creating the environments in which people could deliver care. People just need to remember that everything was shut down, essentially. Uh, we had some emergency services at three hospitals in the area, but, but all of the safety net was, was shuttered. And so we had to build it back from scratch. And it was our chance then to build back something from scratch that was patient-centered in neighborhood, that was really um, great primary care and, and mental health that we built up with these community organizations across the city that still is there and is serving you know, um, hundreds of thousands of people. Really proud of that work. So that was the, uh, very much where, where my energy was being spent. And I was caring for patients in those clinics, but really wanting more to make sure that we were building up that environment and the policy environment to support it. So when Mitch Landrieu um, asked, was running for mayor and, uh, and I served on his health transition team, um, he asked if I would look at being health, uh, the health commissioner for New Orleans. And I 
gently said, no, thank you. I'm um, the vice dean of, of, of uh, the medical school, and I'm on my academic track to being a dean one day. That's what leader, you know, that's the leadership track that I was on. And, but I'll help you find a really good um, um, health commissioner. So I spent a few months trying to help him find someone. Um, we made an offer to a candidate, and she turned it down. And I was so relieved that she did because I wanted the job, and I didn't know until that moment. I remember the moment. I was driving back from Baton Rouge. I'd been doing some work there. Baton Rouge is the capital of Louisiana. And um, I, heard, I heard that she had declined, and I thought, oh, I'm so happy. And I, when I got home, I called him and I said, I, I, I want to do the job, but I'm going to have to take a leave from Tulane because I'm still on an academic leadership path. I'll be a dean, so, you know, whatever. Like, I was still had that in my head, but I said, I, I want to come over and help. And I was, I was um, and, and I'll tell you why I said yes to him. Uh, it, it, there were many reasons, a phenomenal leader. But he also said to me in the, along this process, it's great, Karen, that uh, he's, you know, he said, it's great that we're going to rebuild better quality health care in New Orleans and look at coverage expansion and, and all this. He said, but... I also want a health commissioner who's going to think about all the drivers of, of all the kinds of health. So health is physical and mental and social, and the drivers are physical, mental, and social. And so how can we be thinking about, about um, that, broader, uh, that broader view, widen the aperture, as we would say out here? And I just thought, oh, man, to have a politician who gets that? Um, and he totally gets it. And I was, I was there, I mean, a few hours the first day. Gary, I walked two blocks from, from, from my, the medical school was two blocks from City Hall, and my life changed in that two-block walk that, that morning when I went to my first day uh, in City Hall, and I sat in the cabinet meeting and listened to the people talking about transportation and housing, criminal justice system, and it was all the stuff my patients had been telling me for years about what was interfering with their health, and I was like, oh my God, everyone's, in the, everyone's around this table that can help us build a healthier New Orleans, and this is where I should be. And so I struggled with that for a little while and kept thinking I was going to go back to academics, but eventually I, I had to say, uh, sabbatical probably over. I'm not going to come back to being vice dean or section chief. I'm going to, I, I'm going to step over into public service and see what I can do in this world. And I kept my faculty appointment there for a while. I guess I probably somewhere in the back of my head kept thinking I'm going to go back to that world. But it's, um, you know, when, for me, I, I was definitely built for public service. I will tell you that. I love, 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 love serving community. I love that idea that um, when I get up in the morning, every decision I have to make is, how will this improve the health of my community? It was a, a very wonderful job. The federal service was like that too for me. Looking forward, part two will explore Dr. DeSalvo's federal government service as Assistant Secretary for Health and National Coordinator of Health Information Technology. She will share with us why she accepted the offer to join Google as Chief Health Officer and the opportunity that Google has to influence healthcare.